the weather forecast before we left was showing it was going to be really windy uh, 25 to 35k an hour we've been getting those winds pretty much consistently since we've been here but last night at about two o'clock in the morning it blew up crazy um, awnings had to come in swags had to be moved in close to the cars to protect us from the wind and the sand um, we have to do a bit of a pack down at two o'clock in the morning so we woke up this morning around seven after we got back to bed and um, wind was still blowing its bum off I'm guessing 40 to 50k winds um, that's what it feels like so we've done a bit of a pack this morning and we've left that campsite Anyway, what we decided to do, we're still going to be on the island for at least another day. It may turn out to be another couple of days uh, if the barge can't get us back across home. But the plan for today, we're fully packed up, Tinny's on the roof, uh, and we're pushing the last 10 or so k's north, so the very tip of this, this island. Um, I don't think I'm going to be able to get my drone up in this wind. Uh, if I'm stupid enough, maybe I will, um, but it, it wouldn't be a good idea. And then we're going to spend the day pretty much driving down the, the whole other side of the island. So we've come up on the northern side and we're going to drive back on the southern side um, so that we sort of cover this whole, whole thing and see everything there is to see. Let's have a quick look at this. It's called um, Turtle Bay Lookout. Looks pretty nice. Corrugations. Yeah. There's some really cool history here. So Dirk Hartog lands here in 1616. He climbs up the side of the cliff, susses the area out, and he marks his landing by uh, chiseling out a few details of his crew and the year and all the rest of it and what they're doing here on a, um, on a plate of pewter, and he nails it to a post. It's about 70 meters from here on the cliffs of this, um, this cape. And then about 80 years later, uh, 1697, this fella from Amsterdam is on his own voyage and he comes across the island, he climbs the cliffs and he sees Dirk Hartog's mark has been left there. So he knocks out his own mark as well, he does his own little inscription on a pewter plate and nails it next to Dirk Hartog's one. So 80 years apart these two fellas have both made their mark. Then in the 1800s um, another fella comes along from Paris on his own expedition, uh, climbs up the cliffs and he finds these two plates of pewter with the details inscribed on them and uh, he decides that he wants, to, he wants to take them with him as a bit of a memento of the area um, and they end up in, in, the, uh, in a museum somewhere in Paris um, with some other uh, stuff that was taken from the area. Anyway, since then, uh, around the 1900s, uh, the lighthouse is erected. At some point uh, it had to be manned, which is what that big, that big building is. Um, so that's where the lighthouse keeper was living. Would have been really, really remote. Uh, would have been hard, hard times. Anyway, eventually the lighthouse ends up being automated, so a lighthouse keeper doesn't have to stay here anymore. But um, Depor, Parks and Wildlife over here in WA, they decide that they're gonna renovate this building. And so they're now, even up until today, they're using this building occasionally when they're doing uh, research on migrating humpback whales, uh, the loggerhead turtles and all that kind of stuff. So they come here and they set up camp for these buildings and they utilize that. So yeah, heaps of history, but um, yeah, it would have been really, really tough conditions sailing these seas. That uh, The ocean is wild out there. Um, uh, it's, yeah, open ocean. And conditions like this, when the wind's blowing up, it, it would be a scary place to be. Also tough just living out here, so remote. Um, no lines of communication, a uh, hell of a long way from mainland Australia. Uh, be a yeah, lonely old place to live. Beautiful though. Anyway, let's keep looking around.
as we've been cruising around, we've been finding quite a few remnants of um, an old uh, tram line. So back where we were before, Turtle Bay, they built a 70 metre jetty that went out into the ocean so they could bring big vessels in from mainland Australia with supplies. So from there, it was about 10 k's to here where the lighthouse and the buildings and stuff are. The tram was uh, not no fancy steam powered engines or anything like that. It was either uh, horse drawn or um, they had a like a man powered winch uh, to haul all the building materials they needed from Turtle Bay, the 10 or so k's here to Cape Inscription. So there's still plenty of uh, old tram line laying around and and bits and pieces of bolt and scrap metal and stuff like that, uh, which is testament to what was out here, what was once out here. Are we having lunch here, Gaz? You want, yeah, I don't mind. You want to? It doesn't bother me, but easy as anything, I am. You are easy. <laughs> Jonesy reckons that he'd like to have a fish off here, off the tip of uh, Dirk Hartog. But he wants to, he reckons there's a way to get down to the beach up here so we can have a quick look. Because we're not really set up to, uh, to fish off the cliffs. But if we can get down to the beach, we'll have a go. Edge of Australia. Surely if we can't catch a fish here, we're doing something wrong. spectacular little spot anyway pushing on now around the tip of the point and we're just coming up on some old fishing shack urchin point let's have a look it's like a little pathway down the beach there Come on. 
Oh, yeah, there's a brag board here as well. Cobia, 146 centimeters, 30 plus kilos. No. Are they live? Just the PowerPoints. Okay. Oh, there Hey, this would have been perfect last night to get out the weather, wouldn't it? Yeah. Don't you wish we'd come here? Yeah, yeah, yeah. This would have been sick. Another one of these fishing shacks. This one's called the Block. Uh, looks like you can get down to the beach here too. Although I don't think they want you driving on the beach, um, especially between November and April, because that's when the turtles are coming up for nesting. Have a quick look at this shack. Big limestone blocks here are believed to have been torn from rock ledges and dumped by a tsunami. Oh, wow. Oh, there's little swallows and little birds nesting in here. See the little birds, Jenny? No. Oh, I like how they've got all the windows. Sorry? Cool. All the windows for a bit of a breeze through here. Oh yeah, maybe. Yeah, I'm not sure about that. Yeah, plug outside. Oh yeah, it'd be under your jennies then. You're right. And that there is why it's called the block. So yeah, I reckon the tsunami snapped that off a reef or something and pushed it up here. Pretty crazy. They put dunnies in, um, bush like uh, composting bush toilets in through a lot of these campsites, which is really good. Push on, see what else we can find. So do you fellas know the story behind why they call this Mystery Beach? Nope. Nope. Yeah, me either. Apparently it's a mystery. silence. This looks soft. I can't get too much speed up either. Oh, right, that's going to be a locker job. I don't want to get too much speed up because I don't want to bounce the boat around too much. Gary's just pulled up, thinks he might have popped a tyre, go have a look. There has been a lot of sharp rocks. Sidewall, unfortunately.
we're losing light we've done I don't know we left at 9 o'clock this morning we stopped and had a fish we've stopped and had lunch and we farted around a bit but we've literally covered like 40 k's in I don't know eight hours more and we've got about another 40 to get back to where we wanted to be tonight uh, and the sun's setting in the next 45 minutes and we've been getting lost while the sun's up so we don't stand much chance of the sun set on top of that we've had a blowout on Gary's 200 series and I've had some dramas with my car which I'll tell you about later I think but for now I'm gonna put the camera down we're gonna drive through the dark to get to this campsite it's been a massive day we're smashed I think we're just gonna have a feed and go straight to sleep see you in a bit so that was Dirk Hartog Island um, if you felt like that movie ended pretty abruptly that's because that's how the trip ended quite abruptly uh, on that last day where I left you, I had quite a serious mechanical issue. I ended up getting stuck in two-wheel drive, which made things a lot more difficult. Every time I went into four-wheel drive, I was getting this horrible clunking noise, and I wasn't quite sure what it was until I got home and I was able to pull the bash plates off and, and have a good look. Oh, here's that funny banging noise I had. Just the entire front diff assembly smashing around. <laughs> Shit. So what's happened there is that pin or the bolt that holds that front diff assembly into the cross member has sheared or, or rattled loose and that whole front diff assembly has just been smashing in there between the transmission and that cross member. So I wasn't able to put it in four-wheel drive um, and it was fairly slow going in two-wheel drive with, with some of the, uh, the hills and, and, and the ruts and the loose soft sand and whatnot. So we didn't get in till quite late um, that last night on the island and then we were up first thing and on the barge and heading home. We had planned to do one last night on the way home, um, but it was windy as buggery along that coast. And by that stage, we would, you know, there was sand in the eyes and in the ear holes and we were hanging for a shower and we were quite happy just to, to get going home. I did have a good chat to the boys on the last day though, because I was kind of curious as to whether they um, enjoyed the trip or not what do you what do you think about Dirk Hartog overall I know like we experienced some issues but did you enjoy the trip oh yeah. yeah yeah so yeah definitely it's, it's uh, yeah, yeah. I, th I think you need to um pick your days but you can't really you've got to book for when it's when you can yep. and they and just hope for the best for the weather yeah. I yeah. think and if you have, say weather it's only wind yeah yeah yeah, just, yeah 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 it's nothing else it's yeah like I mean the fishing fishing's great we got some good fish, didn't we? We still did so, well, despite yeah. the conditions. Mm. Yeah, 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 yeah. But yeah, conditions will make it or break it for you, basically. Yeah. 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 We didn't drown and we made it back. Yeah, true, right. yeah. Mm. yeah. <laughs> it was, I mean, for me and probably for you guys too, it was a bucket list yeah. uh, destination. Yep. Yeah, definitely. Uh, I'm still really glad I went. Yeah. But like yeah. you said, I just wish the, the conditions were better yeah. for us. Yeah. Also, in retrospect, it's only a thousand Ks from Perth. But, and we had five days, five nights, six mm. days. Mm. It wasn't long enough, eh? No, no, I didn't, no, no nowhere in the world. You need I seven. I don't think what people realise when you go to that island, you're down to like 30 k's an hour and a yeah. lot of it. And less and for a lot, lot of it. And it's a lot to see. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, there is a lot to see. Yeah. So it's only 70 or 80 k's from tip to top. And that uh, took us anywhere between four and eight hours, whether, you know, with looking at stuff and with dramas mm. and Average whatnot. speed of 20 k's an hour. Yeah. Yeah, definitely, yeah. And the corrugations amongst some of the oh, roughest. Roughest. I've longest. ever done. Not the roughest, but maybe they're just the longest, continuous. Yeah. Just doesn't end. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And when it's not corrugations, it's rocks. Yeah. 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 Sharp ones. <laughs> but yeah, nevertheless, fantastic trip. For those of you wondering about economy and how much fuel and stuff you need to do this trip, Overlander is the last roadhouse you can get fuel from, and it was about 500 to 530 k's return, somewhere around the realm of that. So I end up using on average 17.5 litres per 100 with a tinny on top. The boys in the 200 series both averaged around 19 litres per 100. So I used just under 90 litres of fuel and they used around, the, around 100 litres of fuel. Um, take that into account if you're going to do this trip. Uh, if you've got a standard fuel tank, you'll probably need a jerry can. Uh, we did bring jerry cans and uh, we, because we had them, we utilised them. Um, but with long range tanks, we could have done it without. 
Anyway, that's pretty much a wrap on Durkar Tog Island. Thoroughly enjoyed it, and I definitely recommend you get out there if you can. Um, by the time you guys see this video, I'm about a week off the Perth Full Wheel Drive Show. It's at McCallum Park in Claremont. Perth Full Wheel Drive Show, I'm going to be there with Off-Road Living, the guys that did the 12-volt fit out of my canopy. Um, that will be on display, my vehicle, the 12-volt fit out and everything else that's on the car. Uh, if you're coming to the Perth Full Wheel Drive Show, please come say good day. If you see me standing around like a goose not talking to anyone, come around, shake me hand, say good day, let's have a yarn. Uh, if you want to support the channel, buy some merch. There'll be t-shirts, hats, stubby coolers, all the rest of it. If you don't want to, just come say good day. I'd really appreciate that. Um, I think that's it. I'll see you guys in the next one. Cheers. And that's a wrap. Thanks for a good trip, boys. Cheers, mate. Cheers. Truth is it just don't get old? There's a gravity to grace I can't escape. In the trouble with grace, it gives more than it takes. Yeah, I need grace that gives more than it takes.